What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. Coral farming is a long journey, and sometimes we get a little too comfortable with how things are working. Every so often, we have to take a couple of steps back in order to move forward again. One of those steps for us involved the use of bioblocks. Over the years, we've tried a number of different types and kept some tucked away in our sumps. Where we went wrong was when I started to seed some rock for aquascaping. To make room, I pulled out all of the old bio blocks. Part of that was just logistics, but honestly, those blocks had started to get, for lack of a better word, spongy. They would crumble if handled, and I didn't quite love that. This was also around the time where we upgraded our life support systems with oversized MRC skimmers and filter rollers that were all rated for about a 4,000 gallon system. I figured removing the bio blocks wouldn't matter so much, especially since we were replacing some of that volume with rock. Well, that was a mistake. We ended up with runaway nutrients. Nitrate climbed to around 50 parts per million and phosphate hit 0.2 parts per million. Ideally, we would like to be closer to 10 parts per million nitrate and 0.05 phosphate. We tried more water changes, wet skimming, which we've never really done before, extra siphoning of detritus, still high nutrients. We even dosed live bacteria to feed the corals, which did help a little bit with phosphate, but not nearly enough because, again, we were doing it more so for feeding and less so for nutrient control. Finally, the light bulb went off. Maybe those bioblocks were doing a lot more for us than we thought. It's time to put some more back in. When shopping for new blocks, we decided to try the Polyp Lab Genesis blocks. All right, full transparency time. Polyp Lab has sponsored this channel for years. We've used their brief primer dip and reef roids for ages. And on top of all of that, I consider Phil, the owner, a personal friend of mine. Uh, I do have to tell these guys that uh, I might have slightly nearly killed you this morning. <laughs> <laughs> they are sponsoring this video. They have no input on the content and won't see it before it's published. But make no mistake, this is a sponsored video. With that out of the way, let's talk about what makes these blocks different than what we've used in the past. First big one. A lot of ceramic biological media is known to leach heavy metals. Ceramic materials can contain impurities like aluminum. There's a lot of chatter online about aluminum leaching from bioblocks. In our large systems, we've never had a huge problem with this. Any small leaching gets diluted across thousands of gallons, but in a smaller aquarium, I could definitely see how this could be a serious problem. There are two main ways to minimize this risk at the product level. The first is to have a block that is made with high purity clay that just simply has fewer impurities. The second comes down to heat. A lot of times they're just not fired hot enough. Some products may leach because the kiln temperature needs to be bumped way up. The Polyp Lab block is fired at 600 degrees centigrade. That is about 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to create a ceramic that's practically chemically inert. I can't personally verify the clay sourcing or the firing process. So instead, we've been checking for heavy metals through long-term ICP testing. We've sent out samples for months using three different services to cross-check the results. Here is what we found the most interesting. Aluminum strangely went down. Previously, we hovered right around 20 to 30 parts per billion, and now we're running right around 5 parts per billion, towards the lower end of the normal range. For silica, we're seeing 0.05 parts per million, which is very, very low. Iron is not detected. Ideally, we would see something closer to 2.5, and we are actively dosing this, but it's clearly getting consumed by a reef. Similarly with copper, zinc, and tin, completely not detected. And the only other heavy metal that we were really paying attention to closely is nickel. 
And we're even on the low end of that range, the normal range being three to six, but we're seeing about 2.4. All things considered, compared to our historical data, these results look excellent. Next up, I wanted to look at durability. Our blocks eventually got soft and crumbled, but these are much denser and heavier right out of the box. The Genesis blocks are made from fused ceramic beads. I asked Phil whether the individual beads were porous, but he said they're not. So the anaerobic activity is going to come from the gaps between the beads towards the center of the block. That means nitrifying bacteria, which are aerobic, live on the outer surfaces, while the denitrifying bacteria colonize the lower flow interior areas. They're also physically smaller than some other brands, which at first made me wonder if that meant less performance. But seemingly, they are more efficient by volume. And that means the compact size is actually an advantage in crowded sumps. Here at Tidal Gardens, we employ gigantic sumps. And even still, we run into space issues. So for a hobbyist-sized system, a smaller, more efficient block is a definite selling point. We're using acrylic power rack holders that fit four Genesis blocks each. With our light bio load, each of these racks should handle roughly a thousand gallons, which might be ambitious. So we decided just to add a few extras just to be safe. What we were really looking to accomplish once again was lowering nitrate and phosphate that had kind of gone out of control. Over the past six weeks, the nitrate dropped steadily from right around 50 to 100 parts per million, all the way down to about 10 to 20 parts per million. That is right where we want it. Anything less than 10 parts per million, I get a little bit worried that I'm starving the corals. So moving forward, I want to make sure that we don't strip out too much nitrate by either redistributing some of those blocks to other systems or increased feeding. As for phosphate, which again started at about 0.2 parts per million, it really didn't change that much, which was expected. These blocks don't directly remove phosphate like GFO, for example. However, they can support bacterial populations that consume the organics before they convert to phosphate. So there is this indirect benefit. I am not quite as worried about phosphate level as I was nitrate. So in the future, I may bump up our live bacillus feedings. And if things trended in the wrong direction, we would use GFO for a short period of time. I don't like to use it a lot. So far, I'm impressed with the Genesis blocks. They make a lot of sense for commercial systems like ours. You might be wondering, instead of going with blocks, why don't we just cram more rock into our systems? And a big reason for that is that we run minimal aquascape to keep tanks easy to service. Space in our sumps and space in our growing systems is at a premium, so they're smaller size and solid performance are huge pluses. Now, those commercial advantages might extend to home aquariums as well. Those with heavier bio loads or those with minimalist aquascapes where the biological filtration just needs a boost. All right, guys, that's it for now. So far, so good. Huge thanks to Polyp Lab, the sponsor of this video, and to all of you for watching. Until next time, happy reefing.